Just okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you again for taking a work break with us and joining today's webinar. Uh, I start, I'm starting to see the participants climb up as people get logged in. So we're going to give it just a couple of seconds to let everybody get logged in and settled. Uh, today, we're going to be exploring Shakespeare's Measure for Measure uh, with Michael Segru, a professor of history. Um, we're going to give everybody once again a few moments just to log in. While we do that, if you're already in, please feel free to share in the chat where you're from. We'd love to hear uh, and see who is joining us and where you're joining us from. Also make sure that uh, you switch that panel to all panelists and attendees. We will be sharing the uh, chat panel with everybody after the session. Uh, so if you change it to all panelists plus attendees, that means that everybody can see all of the lovely comments that you might put in there. A play with Shakespeare's typical twists and turns, betrayal, blackmail, hypocrisy, Measure for Measure also dives deeply into religious allegory and one of Shakespeare's more pointed reflections on his current time period. I'm excited to delve into this. Uh, with you and as well as the professor to hear his reflections on this play. We are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion about Measure for Measure. So make sure we would love to hear all of those questions that, that uh, Dr. Segru's lecture may inspire. So make sure you're filling in the Q&A panel as well throughout the lecture. So today, once again, I do have that great pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Segru to our ongoing webinar series, Classics Revisited. I know a number of you have joined us in the past, but for those of you who haven't, Dr. Segru is a professor of history at Ave Maria University. He is a graduate of the Great Books Program. He earned his BA in history from the University of Chicago and his MA, Masters of Philosophy and PhD in history from Columbia University. Prior to taking his position at Ave Maria University, Professor Segru taught at Princeton University, Columbia University, Johns Hopkins University, and so many more. Um, it is a great privilege to have him here with us. My name is Christy Goebel. I'm a global marketing specialist here at Biblioteca. And behind the scenes, we have my colleague, Marie Thurold, helping to make sure everything runs smoothly. We will once again be sharing that chat log with all attendees, so make sure you switch your settings to all attendees and panelists. Um, if you have specific questions, please use the Q&A panel. Uh, that helps us focus those questions uh, to the professor. The like button helps float the most popular questions to the top. So please use that feature if you see a similar question or something you want answered. Once again, we are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion and would love to hear all of your questions. With that, I'm going to hand things over to Michael. We've recorded his reflections in advance, but Dr. Segru will join us at the end to take questions. Shakespeare's Measure for Measure is a very difficult play to interpret. It's caused a lot of controversy among critics um, because although it's a comedy, it's a kind of leaden comedy, a very serious comedy, and it's got a deus ex machina tacked on the end of it, which nobody, found, which few people have found very satisfactory. And uh, it's hard to understand the motivations of at least some of the characters. So uh, we have what's been called a problem play as opposed to a comedy. Uh, it's hard to see exactly what genre we want to use here, but the argument that I would make is that this is a genuine comedy and that it's also an allegory and it's also written uh, with a political intent in mind. A lot of the interpretive problems can be understood once we understand the historical context. For example, this was not given to a public audience. In other words, there are no groundlings. There are no uh, performances of this at the Globe Theater. There are no 
people shouting or, or cursing or, or fighting. This is a very different audience. The only time that this was performed was at court during the Christmas festivities of 1604. So this measure for measure was performed for one and only one audience and then forgotten for about 50 years and not performed at all. Now, of course, during that time, it was not just forgotten. Uh, the Puritans who came, who eventually came to power, they made theater illegal and they were always opposed to theater. And this, of course, would be a very dangerous thing for Shakespeare because Puritans would, were trying to close down his livelihood and destroy his art. And Shakespeare was roused to defend drama, to defend his art, and to attack Puritanism. It, and he did so in the one time that he knew he had the ear of the king, that he would have the court and the king and his courtiers, the various aristocrats. So this was a one-time chance to speak to the court. And what he says, what Shakespeare does, is attack Puritanism. And it's a very tricky thing to do, particularly in the, in the form of a play. Plays have been, traditionally been understood as sources of moral disorder by the Christian tradition. And there's a considerable amount of truth in that. Uh, ancient plays were often associated with uh, various kinds of licentious conduct. Uh, you know, they were in honor of Dionysus. And uh, although in the Middle Ages, uh, Catholic Christianity managed to find a rapprochement with uh, plays, you know, in the medieval morality play, uh, there's always been a tension between drama and Christianity. And the, the Puritans were only too aware of this. The fact that medieval morality plays were a Catholic drama made drama even less attractive to the Puritans. So Shakespeare wants to offer a retort to the Puritans, but he's got a problem. If he attacks them in any bawdy, scurrilous way, that's just more grist for the mill. That just would prove and give them ammunition to make the claim that theater is licentious and immoral uh, because he makes uh, uh, Shakespeare, for example, if he made fun of them, would also involve, be involved in making fun of sacred or holy matters. So Shakespeare lit, lights upon a great idea for how to hoist the Puritans on their own petard. He's going to attack Puritanism in an allegory. And the evil, loathsome, repulsive deputy who's sexually blackmailing a novice nun is the image of Puritan self-righteous hypocrisy. It's the wrong kind of Christianity. Uh, there's a wonderful line where it says, uh, most dangerous is that vice which leads us on to evil while seeking good. Uh, Shakespeare criticizes Puritanism and offers us justification of drama, not just comedy, but all of drama, uh, in a five act allegorical synopsis of the Bible. Now, this is a stroke of genius. The whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation can be found here. And uh, it is a, a meditation on mercy and morality in Vienna, where Vienna is taken to be everywhere, the human, you know, the human condition under all locations. So he's talking about the justification of drama. And slightly earlier, I think it's 1598 or 96, uh, Sir Philip Sidney had written his defense of Posey. And he also was trying to justify drama in the face of Puritan critics. And uh, it's easy to attack the Puritans as pharisaical killjoys. But the problem is they can easily take the moral or what, what seems to be the moral high ground by standing above scurrilous attacks. When Shakespeare decides to use the Bible as a template for his comedy, what that means is, is that he's going to be take, taking lessons and images 
from the biblical mythos and using them in his attack on Puritanism. It's a brilliant strategy if he can make it work. Now, <clears throat> the play starts with the Duke leaving and he says he wants to find out the difference between being and seeming. In other words, people's souls and people's bodies. Can uh, a deputy, in this case, Lord Angelo, live up to the moral requirements of giving strict justice? And uh, Lord Angelo initially says, no, please don't, but accepts because he is represented as, as having a secret hidden vice, which is pride. So Lord Angelo takes the uh, control of Vienna and the Duke goes away. And this is actually connected to the title. The title is drawn from the Synoptic Gospels where a master goes away, leaving his servants in charge and then returns and judges the good and the bad. Right? These eschatological absent master uh, parables are found in all the synoptics, but the one in Luke, all right, involves him coming back and giving very harsh judgment to the wicked servants. All right? Now, uh, the Duke is Yahweh, he's the lawgiver who allowed things to become slack. You'll notice throughout the Old Testament, there's a sin cycle where the chosen people fall away from the commands of Yahweh. He punishes them and then they come back. And in the process, the circle gets bigger as they understand more about Yahweh and more about themselves. Well, something like that is happening here. Um, the Puritans also have to undergo a sin cycle and are going to be shown to be sinful rather than the uh, whitened sepulchers that they appear to be. It's the Gospel of Luke that says that God will repay measure for measure. And this is Shakespeare's uh, repaying measure for measure using the biblical text. Now, the initial problem comes from Claudio and Julieta they have engaged in premarital sex. She is big with child. Uh, Angelo decides to enforce the law strictly and fornication means death. The brother of Claudio, Isabella, is a beautiful young, chaste and virtuous novice nun. She goes and pleads her case the case for a brother with Lord Angelo. And for the first Lord time, Lord Angelo feels sexual desire. He tries to sexually blackmail Isabella. And Isabella says no. And then he threatens to kill her brother if she will not consent. And uh, it's left in a high state of tension. Now, a couple of things worth noting here. The names in this play mean something. Uh, the Duke, who uh, is called by Lucio, that old Duke of Dark Corners, it's a great line, um, is Yahweh, he's God, he's the lawgiver, right? But in his absence, when he stops making theophanies, people go astray. And the most popular of sins has always been sex. <laughs> and uh, it goes from bad to worse. Um, Lucio, who is the devil figure, does his best, Lucifer, uh, does his best to extenuate this, but Isabella is having none of it. Isabella means consecrated to God. It's derived from Hebrew, and that's not an accident. She represents the Christian church, and Angelo is a fallen angel, a would-be saint who is actually a puritanical sinner, just like all the rest of us. Uh, Lord Angelo is described as being precise. In Shakespeare's time, a precision was a synonym for a Puritan. So Lord Angelo's Puritanism gets tested and is found wanting. 
he becomes the diabolical inverse of a good ruler. He tries to debauch Isabella, who represents Christianity. What Shakespeare is saying here is that Puritans are sinful men trying to debauch religion for their own political ends. It's a very powerful and very sharp attack. And you have to remember, everyone in the audience would have been very, very well acquainted with the Bible. In other words, the biblical references in the play would have been obvious to Shakespeare's audience at court in a way that they're not obvious to, to us now, okay? Uh, also, the political assumptions and the uh, facts about politics also will impinge on our understanding of the play. It's everyone in the audience, for example, would have understood that silence means consent. Remember that Thomas More staked his life on that proposition a century earlier, and it was not unknown to the people at court. That's completely impossible. So what that does is remove any element of ambiguity from uh, Isabella's marriage to Angelo at the end, or rather marriage to the Duke at the end. The fact that the Duke asks her to marry her, marry him, and she takes his hand without saying anything means that she is accepting, right? In the next line, Claudio is referred to as the Duke's new brother, and the only kind of brother he could be is a brother-in-law. So although people have tried to find ambiguity in the end, um, Isabella marries Angelo. Now, Angelo had, is a sinful man, and what happens is that the Duke goes away and leaves Angelo in charge, and Angelo goes astray. But the Duke returns in disguise to find out what Lord Angelo is really like, and also to preach uh, forgiveness and uh, charity and, and uh, repentance to people that need it, particularly in jail. In other words, the Duke comes back as the friar, who's a preacher who wants people to repent their sins. Uh, the way I read the friar is the friar is Jesus. And what's going to happen during the next couple of acts is the New Testament, where we'll encounter people like the women, the woman taken in adultery, or uh, the myth of Tamar. And we'll find that all these stories have been lifted from the Bible. The Duke gives advice to Isabella. Remember, Isabella is the Christian church. Uh, it means consecrated to God. Oh, and, and, then he, and of course, the Duke is the friar in disguise. Uh, he says to her, tell Angelo that you will accept his proposition, but it must be at night and in the dark. The Duke then goes to Mariana, whose name means bitter grace, and she consents to a silent nocturnal defloration by Angelo, the loathsome hypocritical deputy who had jilted her in a false abrogation of a marriage contract five years ago. In other words, this is the lamest conceivable motivation, right? This is not the way people actually act. Rather, this is an awful lot like uh, a device to move the allegory along. The reason why is that when Angelo has sex with Mariana, but thinking that he is having sex with Isabella, he is rejecting the light and the word. Again, the religious symbolism is very clear. Mariana eventually is going to plead for his life and Isabella will help. And it's not until Isabella helps to intercede for the life of wicked Angelo, who represents all of wicked man, that the Duke is willing to let the punishment of death go to be to extend mercy, and he is married to and the the uh, and Angelo is married to Mariana. So what we have at the end is a giant mass marriage, as is characteristic of most of Shakespeare's comedies. But even more important, what we have here is uh, uh, 
a series of stories that are drawn from the Bible. To give only one, or to give a couple of examples. Uh, if you know the story of Tamar in the book of Genesis, she was the wife of two of the sons of Judah, and he only had three sons. And when she married the first one, he died. And because of the tradition of Leverite marriage that we have in the book of Genesis, the brother, the next brother, marries uh, the widow. So uh, Tamar is now married to the second brother, and the second brother dies. She says, I have a right to be to a child. I have a right to be married to the third brother. But Judah, their father, is afraid that this is going to cause the death of his youngest and only son. So he refuses and uh, abrogates uh, fraudulently the marriage contract, which is exactly what Andrew, what Angelo does. Thereafter, Tamar pretends to be a prostitute, finds Judah, and has Judah impregnate her. He has nothing to pay her with. He promises her a lamb, and she takes his ring and his staff as security for the, as a kind of deposit for the lamb she's to be paid. Judah impregnates her. And when he hears that she has played the harlot, he gets all kinds of, uh, of angry because this is uh, uh, sin and disgrace upon his house. So Yahweh will be angry and he will be dishonored. He then calls upon Tamar, asks her about her offense, and she produces the ring and the staff, showing him to be the seducer or the impregnator. And uh, Judah says, and this is a big line, my sin has been greater than hers because he knew he had fraudulently abrogated the marriage contract. <coughs> And this, by the way, was an incestuous union. <coughs> Tamar's child is the source of the line of King David. That's right. Uh, adultery, uh, prostitution, and incest were in the line of Jesus himself. This is not the favorite the Bible story of the Puritans. Shakespeare wraps the story, wraps his play around the story and throws it right in their face. And the, she has been more honorable or honest than I. She has been less sinful than I. That's the big judgment. So it would be hard for the Puritans to object to the divinely justified bed switch of Mariana. The subplot, which tries to relieve the heavy wooden characters that we find here, um, only works to an extent. Uh, we find uh, the constable constantly making mistakes. The idea is that human justice is fallible. At the same time, Angelo is constantly reminded by his second in command, Aeschylus, that human frailty is inevitable and it's proper to show a, a, a decent degree of mercy along with dealing out justice. And at that point, Angelo rejects the biblical statement, uh, judge not lest you be judged. Uh, instead says, I should be judged by the same harsh justice I give out. Aeschylus represents the tradition of Greek drama. That's why his name is Aeschylus the tragic writer focused on human frailty. The idea here is that the insights about human limitation that are characteristic of Greek drama are not incompatible with a Christian society, provided they uh, are understood in the right way. People are frail, people are imperfectible, and tragedy can remind us of that. Now, Angelo threatens Isabella and her brother. When he thinks that he has had his way with Isabella, he double crosses her in a Machiavellian move. 
and he has the brother's head cut off. After all, what could she do? It's an unenforceable contract. He has a perfect reputation for justice. So he is hoping that his reputation for justice will allow him this evil. The Duke, of course, is always in charge. Every time in the play that, that someone thinks they're speaking privately, the Duke overhears and knows what's going on. Nobody gets over on the Duke, despite the fact that they think they can. That's why when Lucio, the devil figure, um, says at one point to the Duke, or rather to the friar, oh, the, the Duke is a very bad man. Uh, he, he has a fondness to drink and women and carousing. Uh, the friar says, uh, that's not so. And Lucio says, oh, I know him well. And the friar says, you'll answer for this eventually. So uh, the even Lucio is going to be our comic relief, but he's also going to get judged and treated with mercy at the end. The final part of the book, or rather of the play, seems to me to have been to have been bit been bit uh, been broken up badly by Puritan censors. We have to remember that after 1604, when the play was written or performed, Puritans passed laws preventing the use of the name of God on stage, right, in keeping with the commandments, failing to use the name of God uh, improperly. And what that meant is that books of literature, including Shakespeare's collected plays, were given a very thorough hatchet job. All the references to God were taking, taken out, and there is good textual reason to believe that there are lots of such references that were taken, certainly more than 50. As it is, there's no mention of God at all. Second of all, um, the end cup in, in uh, scene four are a couple of very short uh, I think 12 or 15 line scenes, which seem to have been one larger scene that's been chopped up. Maybe that was the age of the Holy Ghost. I'm not absolutely certain about that. But what I am certain of is that Shakespeare's created here a brilliant retort to puritanical um, claims of moral superiority. In fact, he says, look, all people fall short of moral righteousness, and that includes Puritans. And he chooses the Bible and its stories as a way of showing that even Jesus has moral transgression in his ancestry. And nonetheless, his sacred status is not diminished. He, Jesus, in the in the person in the person of the friar gives uh, absolution to people that confess their sins. When he goes to meet Juliet, who's big with child, he asks her, "Are you sorry for your sins, or are you sorry for getting caught?" And Juliet says, "I'm sorry for my sins." And the and the friar says, "Well, then your sins are forgiven, Benedicte." This is Jesus forgiving the uh, woman taken in adultery. Um, there are lots and lots of such biblical uh, references and connections that would have been very clear to both um, Puritan readers and non-Puritan readers, because at this time, everybody was well-versed in biblical literature and biblical lore. Now, a final point, something to think of. There's been controversy over Shakespeare's religious views and his political views and plenty of and many of his other views as well. And although I think that Shakespeare obviously knew the Bible very well, there's no possibility that he could have done what he did in the course of this text without a thorough knowledge of the Bible. This tells us, alas, nothing about what Plato, what Shakespeare actually believed. And the reason why is this, um, unlike certain figures who have one big idea and uh, get as much as you possibly can out of that. Uh, Shakespeare is very multifarious and very complicated. And I can't tell whether he's a religious believer or not 
much less whether he's a Catholic or a Protestant, or much less whether he's an Anglican or a Puritan. Clearly he hates Puritanism. But then again, they're trying to destroy his livelihood and his art, his art form. Um, what he does believe, I can't tell. And there are people who've made arguments for both sides. I think that either way of reading uh, measure for measure will work. He might have been a religious believer. He might not have been a religious believer. He certainly knew the Bible, and knowing the Bible by itself is not evidence of being a religious believer in Shakespeare's time, right? Uh, I don't think him the devil, but the devil can, can or even second-rate scholars can quote scripture for their purposes. So my point then is that um, Shakespeare here is doing an astonishing job of defending drama against puritanical attacks, attacks which will eventually take control of the government and abolish all theaters in England. He is also justifying uh, drama using uh, the example of, of holding up vice to ridicule that is his treatment of Lord Angelo, the man the, who, would, who would be a, a saint, but is in fact a fallen angel, all right? So um, the, the final scene, the epilogue, the uh, act five, is the end of the world. The Duke comes back, reveals himself, uh, he's no longer disguised. Everybody realizes that the Duke has caught them red-handed, that no one is gonna get away with it. And what happens then is that the Duke dishes out perfect justice to everyone. But then, because Mariana wants clemency for her would-be husband, Angelo, the Duke refuses to give it because he deserves to die. But then it's revealed that Claudio, uh, Lucy, uh, Claudio, who is Isabella's husband, uh, brother, did not die. Instead, of, uh, uh, they did a head trick instead of a bed trick. The brother is still alive. So because life is still, uh, no murder has been committed, Isabella gets on her knees, says, look, even though he tried to kill my brother and tried to blackmail me into sex and cause us both damnation, um, I still think that he deserves clemency and mercy. The Duke gives it to them, and then even gives clemency and mercy to Lucio, who's the who's the devil figure. He ha he's, he's first uh, married to a woman he impregnated, Kate, uh, 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 Mistress Overdone, and he's then to be whipped and, and hanged, but the last two are commuted. His punishment is that he has been married to Mistress Overdone, and I take her to be the whore of Babylon. There's an awful lot of biblical stuff in here. Like Milton, if you want to read this play by Shakespeare, you really need to know something about the biblical mythos. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. And if you can now join us by turning on your camera as well, uh, that would be great. There you Good are, morning. hello, sir. Good morning. How are you today? Very well, thank you. I'm so glad. So we uh, we filmed that about a month and a half ago now, it seems. Uh, it's been nice to, to re-listen to it. And, and thank you so much for filming some of those in advance. And I'm looking forward to our discussion today uh, with our audience members. Um, just a reminder for everybody who wants a, a question answered or may have a question to, to put those into the Q&A box. Um, and we'd be happy to discuss that with everybody for the next uh, few minutes here. I do have to just go ahead. There are so many out there and it is uh, one of our favorite questions that we get is, do you have a favorite translation of Shakespeare's? Well, uh, because I read it in English, uh, um, <laughs> translation <laughs> is a funny choice. It's true. It's true. Uh, or a favorite publication. Like um, right. there, uh, there are so many I mean, different, uh, different. Being a scholar, I like the, the very literal ones, but okay. uh, they may not be suitable to the average reader. Um, getting, getting um, any of the reputable ones, uh, you know, uh, the Shakespeare Foundation. Any, uh, there are quite a few of them. Penguin, anything is reliable. Yeah, Penguin does a really nice, easy to read version. I tend to like Oxford's if I can get them because they have oh, some yes, great. Yes, Oxford's are nice as well. I mean, uh, in other words, there's a whole bunch of 
oh, yeah. web version. So you can't go wrong with that. Wonderful. Well, I have a couple of questions for you that came in from our registrations, uh, which is amazing when people put those questions in ahead of time because it gets us started. Um, the first question is, is in your opinion, is the Duke a good person or a bad person in this particular play? Well, the Duke is, uh, is, uh, is not a person at all in the sense that the Duke is, uh, is God, is a divine figure in the allegory. Now, if you want to look at him as a person, um, he's, uh, he's a tester. He's a revealer. He's, uh, he's going to show us what these seamers be. That's actually one of the lines from Act One. Um, the difference between what human beings appear to be and what actually goes on within the psyche is known only to us as individuals and I guess to God. And so he's going to help, Shakespeare's going to help reveal what's behind uh, the uh, merciless kind of Christianity you get with, with Angelo. So yeah, I would say that he is a good figure, although not without uh, qualities that give you pause. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came in was how did the events of Measure for Measure and Shakespeare in general uh, continue to speak to us and relate to us today? Oh, good God. Well, I mean, you know, the sexual harassment and Me Too movement, I mean, uh, it's not funny. And Shakespeare doesn't think it's funny, but, it, uh, but he is showing how tormented and tormenting it is. So, uh, I mean, one of the strange things is that it's such an improbable comedy because it revolves the story about sexually blackmailing a novice nun, which, I mean, that's just not funny no matter how you look at it. That's the opposite of some of the things you get in Aristophanes, which are just intrinsically funny. Mm -hmm. uh, Shakespeare is using it because he needs the uh, straightforward and rigorous chastity of the church, which is what Isabella represents, all right, she gets married to God at the end. Um, she, it's, it's her absolutely strict adherence to moral propriety that not only saves her, that's what saves Angelo mm -hmm. from himself, ironically enough. Okay. Um, one of the, the questions that came in that I found actually very interesting, because it's not two you normally see put together, but um, the more I thought about it, the more it's a very interesting question, is compare and contrast the humor in Measure for Measure with that in Romeo and Juliet, considering oh, it's a wow. tragedy and a comedy in Shakespeare's classification, but both have a mix of both. Right. Um, the, well, I think that... Uh, the comedy is forced in uh, both plays. I mean, that's what they have in common. Uh, the leaden and very serious theological and philosophical and psychological stuff going on in Measure for Measure um, desperately needs uh, comic relief. So that's what we get with Elbow and Pompey and the mistakes and the constable and his inability to explain what he's trying to do and the mistakes that they make. And yes, uh, if you put it on, uh, measure for measure is a very tricky thing to stage, but you have to have really good slapstick type three stooges idiots doing this to get any kind of humor out of it at all. Yeah. I mean, so that, I mean, you know, that plus also the question of lighting um, if you're going to do a production of Measure for Measure, dark and light are going to count for an awful lot. So at the end, you know, when you have the big scene where everyone's judged, what you would like to see is Lucio trying to slink away and the Duke not looking at him and, and then pointing in, you know, with his finger, you, sir, I wish to talk to you. Because the Duke is like Prospero in The Tempest. He actually knows everything that's going on, despite the fact that people don't know that. Now, if I were to compare this to the comedy in 
Hamlet. Um, it's such a crushing weight, you know, because they're such a nice, they're such a nice couple. It's a pity they have to die. And uh, I'm trying to think of what would count as uh, uh, comic relief. Uh, Mercutio and his railing, or what? what, what, what? Ro Rosencrantz and Guildenstern would be kind of considered the more comedic of the, the characters in the Hamlet factor. Yeah, yeah, okay. And Romeo of course, Tom Stop play. One, you get more of the wit and conversation, I would say, that you get in Romeo and Juliet and the conversations between Romeo and his friends or Romeo and Juliet before the tragic turn. Yeah, I mean, that's not, I mean, I, I find Romeo and Juliet really touching. You know, first love is, and so I guess you would get comedy in uh, in uh, his railing, you know, between the railing between the Capulets and the Montagues early on, you know, where Mercutio gets killed off. But uh, we, we uh, have uh, an audience member also saying, and the nurse, the nurse adds some comedic flavor. Oh, right, yes, the nurse is funny, okay. yes, that's true. Uh, so yeah, they always have, often have good lines, not just in, in uh, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the questions that also came in um, that I'm seeing in the chat box is what first led you to research and learn more about the connections between Shakespeare and religion? Do you well, think there are anti-Puritan undertones to all of his works? They may well be there. In other words, um, I can't imagine any uh, Shakespeare representing Puritanism uh, favorably. Um, he may gloss over it, he may not touch upon it, uh, and he certainly represents Protestantism favorably in King John, if you know that play. But uh, what interested me was, first of all, the fact that it's, I, I was getting bit, the sense that there were bits and pieces of an allegory here. It actually took me 25 years to put to put these pieces together and realize what this was or what I'm reasonably sure it was, which is a, a five act philosophical comedy, um, which is a synopsis of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, it's the beginning and the end. And that is why it's so hard for the Puritans to object to his attack on them because he's using the Bible. And uh, it's not scurrilous, it's not bawdy. But when he says things like all sects, all uh, ages smack of this vice, he's essentially telling the Puritans to chill out. Now, um, in, in my previous research, as well as listening to your lectures, I, I had to go and look up a couple of facts. So Queen Elizabeth, I know ruled until 1603 when she passed. Right. And she passed, James, James I took over, which of right. course, really close to measure for measure coming out. He took over halfway through uh, 1603, obviously all through 1604. Um, Queen Elizabeth, although a supporter of religious compromise and peace was a stout Protestant and even took measures numerous times to curb Puritan control throughout her life. Puritans also would not really gain control of England for another 45 years after measure for measure was done. So I guess my question is, is that I know that James did try to make settlements with the Puritans, but were there really, were they really that much of a threat in court itself? Would they have been in court during the 1604 performance? Well, regard, well, a number of layered mm -hmm. issues there. First off, it was not just produced in 1604, it was produced at the Christmas festivities, St. Stephen's mm -hmm. Day. So what we call Boxing Day today. And Puritans didn't celebrate Christmas because it was a Popish holiday. Anglicans celebrated it. So the Puritans, whether they were fixtures at court or not, or people sell, uh, sympathetic to Puritanism, whether they were courtiers or not, they're not going to be around for the Christmas festivities. All right. Uh, what that means is, is that Shakespeare is going to have this one and only one shot at talking to the king and favorably disposed courtiers. And he's, uh, what is it that it says in, in Hamilton? I'm not giving, throwing away my shot. He's got one shot to justify drama and to say to the king, look, these Puritans are not what they seem to be. All right. And he's right about that. Uh, pure, 
Puritanism, both then and now, um, takes uh, a very hard moral line, but they're oblivious to their own pride. There's a definite satisfaction that they have in being so much better than everybody else. And uh, that, of course, is a dangerous attitude politically. So would you consider this more of um, almost Shakespeare with his The Ear of the King basically just doing a warning for, well, for the no, king? Well, no, he's trying to prevent uh, thing, at least hold off measures that are actually going to be taken in the next, uh, well, uh, in Shakespeare's time and later. In other words, they had already made a fornication, a, a, a capital offense, which it hadn't been before. They uh, remember that the Puritans, while not all, all that numerous, tended to be a very powerfully organized minority. Uh, you could get that, you can actually get a lot more done with a small number of very dedicated people like the Jacobins or like the Bolsheviks, all right, than you can with a mass movement. It's very unwieldy. It's like riding a dinosaur. But if you've got a small number of people that are really dedicated and fanatical, yeah, you can get a lot done because the Puritans had a very disproportionate influence in Parliament, in the House of Commons, and uh, they were they were uh, also uh, in uh, uh, cities, they tended to be well-educated. So these are middle-class uh, merchants for the most part and uh, city dwellers. And uh, they had uh, influence particularly over things like theater because that's where you find uh, theaters in urban environments. So their attacks on on theater were coming to fruition. Uh, it be, they made it I illegal to mention God's name on the, in, on, the, on stage. And that, that happened actually during Shakespeare's lifetime. Mm -hmm. So uh, no, they, they, they're not a numerous group, but they're a powerful group. Got it. Um, we can draw a lot of parallels to our time for sure uh, in, in the Puritans and how yeah. the Puritans took power. But I have a question. So Shakespeare wrote over 30 plays, some with various statements of what may have been happening in the world, like, you know, political statements. But, but ultimately, he, he um, was not overly like, uh, how do I say this? He, he was never really a very pusher of his ideals. He was more of comedic tragedy, all of that stuff. Um, after many discussions, lectures, arguments over his works uh, that I've studied and done, uh, rarely do I view that he wrote a pointed play to make a statement. Like every once in a while, you have some of those hidden meanings in there. But as you are indica indicating, he wrote measure for measure for that purpose almost. This so, was purpose built, yeah. Yeah. So why why now or you know why then? Why would he change the intent of most of his works in 1604 versus any other time in his career? Well, because. He wasn't invited to give, uh, uh, to, to, to produce a play at court in Elizabeth's time. If he was, I'm sure he would have jumped on it. But he was given this opportunity. And you know that some strings must have been pulled to actually get that organized. And no doubt the politics beyond that are very interesting. It's just that uh, no evidence, no history. There's not much we can do with that. But somebody got that produced. And then, it's a very interesting thing, it was never a popular play. It isn't a popular play now. It was not produced, but the, except for that one time, until after 1660. So, Which would be close to the end of the Puritan reign. At right, the, right. You know, so yeah. it's not until the Restoration that we're going to get the second production of that, the second night, which makes it unique in the Shakespearean corpus. It's not quite like that. This was in some ways a, a message from our sponsor, from what you might call the Poets Guild. He says, look, don't listen to the stuff that the, that the religious fanatics are saying about the poets. We have lots of good stuff to do, like holding vice up to ridicule. On the other hand, while we're holding vice up to ridicule, have you noticed how proud and arrogant and uh, licentious and hypocritical these Puritans are? Well, I had. 
I mean, it's a work of genius, you have to admit, or at least that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. I think it's the most brilliant comedy ever written because it's so uh, far reaching in its ambitions. Well, and, and one of the things you mentioned numerous times in, in the in the lecture was obviously um, at, in, in the day of Shakespeare, uh, the, we were in the Church of England at, with, with the Puritans slowly gaining control. Um, but church was, religion was definitely in everybody's life. Like uh, the, we were in the age of illiteracy for sure for a good chunk of people, but they were still attending church numerous times a week getting read from the bible from their their priests and pastors but um if if shakespeare wanted to say like think that this was going to become a more popular play than it did which from the sounds of it in theories it sounds like he could care less he wanted the ear of the king when he had the chance um but would his allegory have made sense to more of the common man if this were to ever go to the globe at the time <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, some of the audience in the Globe would certainly have picked it up. So, um, I imagine that the literate element would. Now, what percentage of the literate element would is, uh, what percentage of, of the audience was literate is very hard to say. And it's important for us to understand, again, the historical context, which is everything for this particular play in, in specific, but it's helpful in Shakespeare in general. But um, you have to consider the fact that uh, at least the literate people would have seen Professor? Well, I think we may have lost the professor for a second. I apologize for that. Um, we will get uh, any of his other comments uh, coming up in a second here. Uh, but while we wait to see if he can come back, let me uh, go forward to just say thank you so much uh, for the great conversation. Um, if he's able to join us again, that would be awesome. Um, but if you are enjoying the Classics Revisited series with Professor Michael Segru, we do have one more title that will be aired this year on December 8th. It is The Book of the Courtier. Uh, it does look like the professor possibly logged off, so hopefully he'll come back on. I apologize for the interruption here. We all face it with the Zoom days. Uh, the Book of the Courtier uh, by Cast, I'm going to say this wrong and I apologize, by Castiglione. Uh, it's a rarer book, but it is a great reflection on what it was like to be in court uh, during uh, the, the 16th century in France uh, in the French Revolution area. Um, if you are enjoying these um, as well, we've had a lot of uh, libraries ask us if they can share these lectures um, with their patrons, which is not something normally we do at Biblioteca because most of our content tends to be very library focused. Um, however, we have decided that this sounds like a great idea. So we are actually gonna be moving all of the lectures, webinars, uh, or the professor's webinars uh, with us on the Classics Revisited series uh, to YouTube uh, so that libraries, if you want to promote them to your patrons, there will be no form to be filled out. Um, there's no on-demand factor. Um, you can still go to our website or direct them to our website, biblioteca.com forward slash events, go to the Classics Revisited, and all of those links will be on there by the end of the day tomorrow, including this one to watch uh, when you want, where you want, open to the public. Um, so we are excited about that change and feel free to then promote it um, to anybody who is interested in, in these books, whether they work at a library or enjoy um, coming to the library. We also have a webinar coming up on December, um, on December 9th with two library leaders adjusting their collection development strategies to meet the evolving needs of the patron. So we encourage you to check that out. And once again, all of our webinars that we've been hosting over the past couple of uh, months uh, especially during the pandemic. We are planning on continuing hosting webinar series, uh, possibly with Professor uh, Sugru coming into the new year as well. Um, but everything can be viewed at biblioteca.com forward slash events um, and everything is on demand. So feel free to go look at our past, uh, past webinars as well. And finally, um, after today's webinar, uh, as we finish it up uh, and you log off, a quick survey will pop up. I once again apologize that uh, the professor was unable to 
uh, stay connected with us long enough to complete his final answers. I feel feel sad because Shakespeare is a guilty pleasure of mine, so I would have preferred to, to keep talking with him for the final couple of minutes here. Um, but if you do have any questions for him, feel free to reach out to info at biblioteca.com and I will definitely get those questions over to uh, Michael. Um, if you do have any questions um, or let us know how you feel about today's webinar or the series in general, we would love to hear from you. Fill out the survey uh, that pops up on the, at the end of the webinar. So once again, thank you so much. I apologize uh, that, that we lost that connection with the professor, but he will be back on December 8th with uh, the Book of the Courtier. Thank you so much.